Hello Hellions, welcome to episode 8b, in which we discuss two more sound changes in late Old English. And then yes, I promise I will be able to let it go, let it gone. And then we'll get to the main event, historically speaking, of this unit that is the Norman Conquest. So off we go. Do you remember this word story about Lord and Lady? and how English has those words instead of master and dame, which are common in, say, French. Look at the first two stages of the uh, simplification of hlaf voyard into lord and hlaf dia into lady. From early Old English to late Old English, we basically have the loss of an H. HL, hlaf for loaf, goes to laf. And that introduces our first sound change which I'm just going to call simplification of an, in, an initial consonance. Old English had a lot of consonant clusters at the beginning of a word. It's a very big part of the distinctive sound of Old English. And they were getting reduced in Middle English. And I think as you go through these, you won't have to memorize anything new. You'll just see, ah, that looks more familiar. So the loss of initial H. And here I'm just going to take a moment to tell you what some words sounded like in Old English before they came to their modern form. To laugh was chleachian. Doesn't that sound like laughing? It's a bit of onomatopoeia. Chleachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachachach
like like a just a, a shouted out word. The first word of Beowulf is what we gardenia in yeyar dagom. We the spear Danes and days of old. But the first word is just what with an exclamation point. And it it's it's funny if you look at like an old maybe like hundred year old translation of Beowulf. The word what is translated as low, like L-O, like low in days of old. We this, no, it's not low. Um, we don't have a word for it, but my best translation is put down your meat and listen up. I'm going to tell you a story. That's basically what what means. But another loss of initial H. The second sound change in late Old English we will discuss is metathesis. You might know that word from another context. Metathesis. Oh, let's just go to Winnie the Pooh. Here's a very good explanation. So it's Eeyore's birthday, and Pooh says, I'm giving him a useful pot to keep things in, and I wanted to ask you, Is this it? said Al. Yes, and I wanted to ask you, Someone has been keeping honey in it. Oh, you can keep anything in it. It's very useful like that. And I wanted to ask you, you ought to write a happy birthday on it. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you, said Pooh, because my spelling is wobbly. It's good spelling, but it wobbles, and the letters get in the wrong places. Would you write a happy birthday on it for me? What Pooh is talking about is metathesis. It's good spelling, but it wobbles and the letters get in the wrong places. Metathesis in linguistics is when letters switch places. You can think about it as the Old English version of leapfrog. More technically, two adjacent phonemes, that is language sounds, switch places or wobbly letters. We've already seen one example of this. The Old English word for to ask is the verb axion. Eon is just a verb ending. So basically, ox becomes ask. And you see what's leapfrogged. The S and the K have switched places. So I love the idea of Beowulf, ask you a question, sucker. I, I see him in that image right there. That's what he's saying. That's the caption right there. He asked you a question, possibly with his axe. Another example of late Old English metathesis. Uh, there's an early Middle English lyric called Brid on a Brer, which is bird on a briar. It's about the coming of spring. And I know it's early Middle English, but some of those Old English things do hold on into Middle English. Notice that it's not bird on a briar, but it alliterates, which the Old English like to do. It's their poetry, right? So it's Brid on a Brer. What has undergone metathesis? The R and the I. Brid becomes bird, and you do the R afterwards. Vowels and R's very often do switch places. It's happening all throughout late Old English. Uh, their word for through had the R after the vowel. It was through, you, then the R. By the way, that should seem very familiar if you know some German. The German word for through is durch which sounds a lot like it. And in that case, the R is after the vowel, too. You can see why I loved Old English, why it just seemed familiar, because I had German. And just another example of vowels and R's playing leapfrog, our word bright, with the vowel after the R, was in Old English. Think how to pronounce it. That non-initial H makes the H, so beort. And if you know that, you can look at Old English and, and get even more words than you might get through just direct familiarity because you know these transformations. Metathesis, common in all languages, happening distinctly in late Old English. Now, I cannot talk about metathesis. It's just not allowed, at least in my universe, without talking about the patron paint. I'm sorry, I messed that up. The patron saint of metathesis, who is... Dr. Spooner, a 19th century Oxford professor, who had a little bit of a speech impediment. And Dr. Spooner gives us the term Spoonerism, which is a wonderful word, nothing to do with cutlery. A Spoonerism is a kind of metathesis. 
but it happens not between two sounds in one word, but the initial sounds in two words. They switch their initial sounds. It's a thing that he just, his brain did. Uh, spoonerism is an eponym, by the way, because an eponym is a word named after a person or place. Uh, sandwich is an eponym because apparently there was an earl of a place called Sandwich in England, and he liked to eat his uh, meat between bread. And so Sandwich goes back to that guy. Spoonerism also goes back to a, a person. We have several examples of this. I'm just going to enjoy going through these. Some of them have to be spurious, apocryphal, made up, like, oh, wouldn't it have been great if he had said this, Spoonerism, when that's just a, a little too cute. But a lot of these he actually did say. Let's play along. I'll tell you what he said, and you think in your mind or answer back what it means. The Lord is a shoving leopard. And yes, I did find an image of that. I can't imagine why. Just goes to show you the internet has pictures of everything. The Lord is a loving shepherd, of course. See how to play? Metathesis, like in Old English. It's relevant, trust me. It is customary to cuss the bride. Stupid bride. Yes, it's customary to kiss the bride. Pardon me, Padam. This pie is occupied. Can I sew you to another sheet? If you need to, pause and work through that one. That one, I think, is too cute to really be him. Ah, uh, when our boys return from France, we'll have the hags flung out. You find it? Look for the ridiculous part of the sentence and then switch letters and see what you get. Which of us, and this is true, has not felt in his heart a half-warmed fish? Got it? A half-formed wish? Whew, I love that one. Go and shake a tower. Someone smells bad. A well-boiled icicle. I really like my icicles well-boiled, don't you? They ride so much more smoothly that way. Is the bean dizzy? Something you might ask around Oxford. <laughs> dizzy beans all over. And also, with the same idea, let us raise our glasses to the queer old dean. I, I doubt the dean appreciated that, given the sentiments of the time. Of course, we weren't talking about the dean, were we? And finally, the magnificent and almost certainly made up you have hissed all my mystery lectures and were caught fighting a liar in the quad. Having tasted two worms, that's about semesters, you will leave by the next town drain. I believe there are about four of them in there. Ah, fun with metathesis or spoonerisms. And of course, who could forget Sarah Palin and Paris Allen, and a book whose title I don't really care to pronounce. Okay, it's time for the main event, the Norman Conquest, and that date you will die muttering as your last words, 1066, Norman Conquest. First of all, Normandy is where the Normans are from. You actually know Normandy. Uh, if you, it's familiar. This is the northwest region of France. It's the closest bit of France there. Uh, we, we talked about it uh, originally as being the home to some Celts. We're, we're not talking about that group anymore, but we've seen that little northwest part of France before. Just across the uh, English Channel from England. It has white cliffs, just like Dover has white cliffs. I'm looking over the white cliffs of Dover. Uh, it's also famous for the, being the location where the D-Day troops landed in June of 44, one year before the end of World War II, where the Allies, staged in England, uh, sent all of those wonderful ships uh, across the English Channel to, uh, to push back against Hitler on the continent. They landed in Normandy, right? Uh, terrible shelling, terrible loss of life. This is another invasion, goes the other direction, from Normandy towards London.
So, 1066, a bit of background, and we'll just do history for a minute. I hope you'll read more of this history someday. It's fascinating, but right now, just a little bit of orienting history. 1066, before the events we're talking about, there's an English king named Edward the Confessor. He was always going around saying, I chopped down the apple tree, and I have lust in my heart. And he dies without any hair. I'm sorry, without any heir, without any heir to take over the throne. So there's a succession crisis. Uh, a duke named Harold becomes king the next day. He's a powerful day. He's been a chief uh, counselor. He's the son of another power, a very powerful family. He assumes the throne. However, in situations like this, or an important kingdom like England, uh, has an uncertain, that is sort of non-hereditary succession, they're often challengers. Keep in mind that the nobility of Europe has pretty much always intermarried. And so if you don't have a child, there's a good chance that your father married someone from Bohemia or Norway or Scotland. And you've got a cousin out there who also has a claim to the throne. And in Normandy, North France, uh, Duke William, he's not the king of France, he's a duke, uh, challenges Harold and says, I am actually in line to become the king of England. He's a cousin. Uh, supposedly, Edward had said, I'm, I'm leaving it all to you, cuz. And uh, also supposedly, at least there's some documents that say even Harold acknowledged that he had the rightful claim to the throne. Well, Duke William says, I'm not having any of this business. And he comes with something like 8,000 Frenchmen. Oh, and the French language. Very important. He's packed that. Uh, and it hits the Anglo-Saxon world like a meteor hitting the earth. Um, Harold is away um, fighting to the north, Norway. But when England is attacked from the south, he, he hurries back to meet William, soon to be the conqueror. And you should learn, just for basic, you know, human literacy, the Battle of Hastings, 1066, William the Conqueror, Battle of Hastings, put all that right in your brain, is, is the decisive uh, victory. There's, there's a little bit of uh, luring and a feigned retreat. And Harold, now look at the image, Harold... Rex and Harold, he, that's Harold, right? Between the O and the air of Harold in the image. Rex, meaning he was a Tyrannosaurus Rex, large, very large dinosaur. Interfectus est. And that means he's, um, he's done away with. He is killed. So Harold King is killed at the Battle of Hastings, paving the way for Duke William to become the English king. And when? It's just nice to remember. Christmas Day. Happy Christmas present, but he does this after a long battle which burns much of Southeast England. That image I just showed you is a panel from the Bayou Tapestry. In Bayou, uh, I don't know who exactly, took it upon themselves, probably monks, nuns, to depict the entire Norman conquest. And it is this gigantic single cloth, 20 inches tall, so a foot and a half tall, 230 feet long. Would you like to see it? Pretty impressive, right? It actually looks better uh, close up. There's a better view. In Latin, as history was written in Latin, all of what we think of as Europe would speak different languages, local dialects. Latin was kind of the lingua franca, the the general language understood and by educated people in all these areas. And it goes through with wonderful scene by scene uh, depiction of the Norman conquest. It's in Bayou, uh, France. Today you can still go see it. Here are some panels. Um, you see Edward Rex, so the dinosaur Edward, I might be translating that wrong, uh, sends Harold off to Norway. It's before uh, he died, of course. It's usually when we do things. Here's William crossing the English Channel. He lands at Pevensey. You see up at the top. Interesting uh, example of what a Norman ship would have looked like. Notice the bow and the stern would have been carved. 
the Battle of Hastings itself. Notice the margins. Uh, medieval manuscripts uh, love to put uh, marginalia. Often they're a, uh, a, uh, like a nature image, like vines. Uh, sometimes they're animals. Here we have, notice, dead Englishmen <laughs> lying. Oh, and also parts of dead Englishmen. See the head on the bottom. And on the top, they're animals. Not just any animals, though. These are the animals of war. They're the animals that come like the kite and the wolf, and they eat the bodies. So a rather grim image. Here, how old? It's an up close to what I showed you. Interfectus est. How did he die? It looks like he's, I don't know, um, scratching his nose with a bit of like wheat or something. No, he is shot with an arrow through the eyeball. Does not die immediately, actually. So wonderful little tidbit about how we got rid of Harold. Oh, and here's a recently discovered panel of the tapestry. It's right at the end. Um, it's in Latin. Let me just translate this for you. So he here, Darcos Vadoros, the V and the U are the same. U comes from V, so a, a double U is really just a double V. Darcos Vadoros, Lux Gladium Tenet. Lux, like Deus es Lux, God is light, that's light. Gladium, like gladiola, the flower, means um, a sword. Tenet, like your tenets are things you hold to, your beliefs, holds. Hic Darcos Vadoros, Lux Gladium Tenet, holds the, um, the light sword. And he's saying, Ego sum pater tuus. Ego, which is waffles. Sum, which is the total in math. Uh, pater tuus, your father. Something about waffles being your father. And as he falls, falls we have uh, Lucius, Lucius, Caliambulus. Oh, that works so beautifully. Uh, Caelus, uh, cielo or caelum is ceiling in English, um, or it's from the Latin word for sky. Ambulus is, is walk, like an ambulance is originally to per ambulate is to walk. Caeliambulus is sky walker. Non est verus. It's not true. Uh, a little known ending to the Bayou Tapestry. So who are these Mormons? I'm sorry, Normans. Why don't we just say the French conquest? And I will refer to them as French, but these are not just any French people. They're Normans. What does that even mean? Norman is short, a shortening for Norse men, which means North men. These are not, it's hard to speak of originally French. These are not um, a, 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 an originally French group. These are a later group of settlers who assimilated into French culture. And they were really colonists. And what they were actually is Vikings. They were Vikings who had invaded, and this happened to the Anglo-Saxons as well. Lots and lots of Viking invasions. We didn't pay attention to that, but it's a big subject. They'd settled there only a couple centuries before. So they spoke French, probably with a bit of a German accent. So, the French invasion of 1066, just, just pause and, and, and sum up the whole history of these Celtic British islands. Um, after the Celts are there, the Angles and Saxons come, right? They're German, Germanic. These French who come, these are actually more Germans, which is why you can say in this book, the Norman invasion of England, the Norwegian invasion of England in 1066. So let's just pause and review. Germanic invasions of Britain, including 440, I don't know, 7, 9, 50, 450 or so, Angles and Saxons, giving us Old English. 793 is when the Vikings hit Britain. And you get a whole bunch of, these are Germanic people also, but they're Scandinavians, Vikings. They settle a lot of, of uh, Central and Northern England. 1066, Frenchified Vikings. And that turns Old English into Middle English, OE into ME. Of course, 1915, World War I. And 1940, World War II, which is the whole reason why Susan, Peter, Edmund, and Lucy 
uh, have to go out to out of the, uh, London to uh, to go through the uh, wardrobe. So the Germans, they just keep hitting Britain. You are now at a point where I can give you the formula for English. Yes, this is reductive, but I was a math major before I was a, a literature and language major. And I, I love math. I love formulas. Here is the formula. It's super reductive, but it's also kind of a summary of the entire class for you. Like a don't ever forget this moment, or it will all have been a waste. The formula for English. Behold. English equals German plus French. So English, spoken around the world, is German, by which I'm referring to Old English, the language of the Angles and Saxons, invited to Britain by the Celts in the 400s, plus the Norman invasion, 1066. Norman the, uh, William the Conqueror, Battle of Hastings, turns Old English into Middle English by bringing all those French words. I apologize for the um, images there. They're rather stereotypical, possibly offensive. I could have just done flags, but I thought these were cute at the time. So what are the effects of 1066? Well, for, let me just summarize first of all, then we'll go through some of the, of the um, specifics. Um, for a couple of hundred years, England is basically part of Normandy, which is to say part of France. That is administratively, that is in the upper echelons of society, of the hierarchies of power in both church and state. For 200 years, the Normans rule England. We've basically chopped off English society above the peasants and replaced people in the castles, people in the church, people in the, the crown with French speakers. So French is spoken in English for a couple hundred years. Do you know that? And even after they're kicked out, they leave their words behind because that's how things happen, right? And English, once people return to speaking English again, it's not the same English. You might say you can take the Normans out of England, but you can't take the French out of English. So the effects of 1066. A French nobility. Think, like in wars, much of the English nobility had died in battle. There's now a hierarchy with French spoken at the upper level. The uh, Hlaf Weyarda and Hlaf Dia are now masters and dames, dames. The church also has a hierarchy. William installs the French in the church leadership. There are archbishops, Canterbury, and I think what York is the other one. They're French, and they appoint the bishops who are French. Monasteries have abbots. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're Norman. And all these opportunities, hey, for advancement, draw even more Normans from France. In other words, Norman French is the language of power. And the native Anglo-Saxons, Germanic speakers, are learning French to get ahead in life. And so you have a class division based on language. English, the language of the field, the stable, the, you know, the shack, the, the pew. French, the language of the court, the castle, the cathedral, of, of the higher professions. Even if you study English literature of the Middle Ages, which is one of the things I did in graduate school, studying English literature from the late 11th century, 12th century, into the 13th century, you're studying it in French because English literature was French literature for a couple centuries. And that last line gives you an idea of where uh, prestige in marital uh, alliances was. When I first decided to study Middle English, one of my major fields, worst, first thing I learned was you have to know three languages. You've got to know English, Old English, because that's the language the peasants would trade and farm in. You need to know Latin because that's just the language of the medieval church. 
And you'd need to know French, and not just any French, but a kind of Anglo-Norman <clears throat> French, which the king, court, aristocracy, and church would speak. All of that going on in this melting pot time. To illustrate what we've been talking about, I want to go to another chronicle, and it's a chronicle by a guy named Robert of Gloucester. Notice we've skipped over a couple of centuries here, from 1066 to the 1300s, because I wanted to find a text in early Middle English which describes the Norman invasion, the Norman conquest. But you've got to go a couple hundred years because, why? Everything in between would have been written en français, even though you're in England. I like to look at pictures, so I couldn't find a picture of Robert of Gloucester, but I like to imagine he looked like this. So we'll just say that's Robert of Gloucester. You should have a handout. Take out your handout. We're going to walk through this early Middle English now, about a dozen lines, in which he tells about the Norman Quan conquest and then pauses to talk about and reflect on the state of language and power in England in his own time. And he's going to give us some advice as 13th century people for how to use language to our own benefit. I'll ask you three questions in the homework. Pause the lecture and read through those. These are some things you're looking for. And here is the text we're going to read. The stained glass, by the way, is from Gloucester Cathedral. It's still standing today, beautiful structure. Before we begin digging into uh, Middle English, I just want to say I'm not going to give you a lot of technical details like I did with Old English. Inflections have gone away. We've become a word order language. Uh, spelling is coming more and more to look like modern English. I, I bet actually you could read this just straight off the page and, and get the gist of it. And when I give you the meaning of the green words, which I'll ask you to write in and note, annotate on your handout, you'll get even more of it. Uh, so the story of our class from now on will be the story of English coming to be more and more familiar, looking more like what we know as English. So the first word, thus. Yes, we're still using a thorn in the 13th century. Thus. Thus come lo Engeland into Normandy's hond. He's talking about 1066. And you can st st still see Engel in the word Engeland. It's England today, but Engeland, the land of the Angles, came into Normandy's hond. Notice he's saying Normandy's, not France's. He's making a distinction, the dukedom versus the, uh, the, the kingdom of France. Now look at Normandy's. It's missing a couple things that we would add in modern English because of our conventions. We capitalize proper names, like Normandy. They did not. It's also missing something at the end of the word. It's possessive, genitive. Uh, it has an S, but there's no apostrophe. The apostrophe will not arrive for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's a much later development. The second line begins with an ampersand. Keep in mind, printing won't arrive until 1450s. Um, this is 13th century. So we're still writing on vellum or parchment, animal skin. We're still saving as much space as possible. An ampersand is a standard scribal abbreviation. And the Normans ne could speak though but her own speech. So, and the Normans could that is, ne couth, that is, could not. Couth is interesting. Couth, it sound, it's the word for could, uh, and it's about knowledge or familiarity. We don't have the word couth today, but we have the word uncouth. What's someone who's uncouth? They're rude. They don't know how to be polite. The, the key here is knowing. The Normans did not or could not speak anything but their own speech. If you are couth, you, you know how to act, behave, or speak. If you are uncouth, you know not how to speak. So these are some uncouth Normans. But is nothing but, nothing other than their own speech. They were monolingual. Whore, um, it's not a prostitute. Our 
pronouns are taking their modern forms, it's their own speech. And speak French. And just notice the spelling of French for the moment. It's familiar. Again, not capitalized. As he, that looks like Old English, right? As he, that's what they did Adam. I didn't think Adams would be discovered until a long time later. Niels Bohr and all that. Nope. Actually, this is a bit of phonetic writing. This is two words. This is, where did they speak French? At home. At home, right? And her children, a, a dude also teach. That dude is dead. So they spoke French. When they came here, they didn't change our language. They were monolingual. They kept their French, just like they spoke at home and taught their children. Dude, did, play spin the vowel, right? So what is the effect of all this? So, the so is crucial. That higher men of this land, what are we talking about? Class. Powerful people. High ranked people. High men of this land, England, that of her blood comma. So high men of this land come all of their blood. They're all descendants of the Normans. And what do they do? Holdeth all the speech that he of home noma. You need some words here. So those Normans, high men of our land that come from the Normans, hold, and we still have the, the inflectional ending, holdeth, they uh, would be hold off in Old English, but holdeth, just like we have that until Shakespeare. All the is the ilke, the same speech that he is they, from home, noma. If, if you have German, nehmen is to take. This is the word to take. They hold, here in England, all the same speech that they took from home. Now notice that that's a bit of commentary on people and their languages. First of all, it, it makes language a thing. They held, like Darth, Darth Vader's tenet holds the uh, lux gladium. They hold their language. You and I hold on to our own languages. It, has, it gives it a kind of tangibility, like a book or a thing. And language is something we hold on to even when we move to another land. Immigrants hold on to their own language because it's, it's their heart language. It's meaningful. And they hold on to it. And especially when you're in power, you get to hold on to it without paying a price. And now a sort of... Uh, Further conclusion, for, that's for, but unless a man con French, con is no, for but a man con French, may tell of him lut, for unless a man knows French, I account of him little. In other words, let's go through these words, but a man Less a man know French. Notice it's spelled differently than it was above. CH and SS. Spelling was not regularized. The whole idea of correct spelling, hundreds and hundreds of years away. Dictionaries with spelling, standardization, doesn't exist yet. Two French spellings right there. Now this word tell. I tell of him lut. Lut is little. I tell little of him. What does tell mean? This is not tell in the sense of tell a story or tell what happened on Thursday. This is tell like bank teller, a person who counts money at a bank. We're talking about like value. The best way I can think to render this in modern English is, unless you speak French, I count him little or I, I count little of him or I reckon his worth to be little. And now we have the counterpart to the high men. We have low men. We start with ak, which is Old English, perfect Old English, means but. Low women, high men, now low men, what are they? They're also doing their own holding. They hold to English. So there's not been a mixing very much of the two languages. Yet, actually, there has, but he doesn't see it. It's just that English has become Frenchified, Normanified. But low men hold to English. So we've aligned language and class, haven't we? You can tell language not by, well, like skin color under apartheid in South Africa. Here it's language that distinguishes the classes. 
lo men hold to English and to their own speech yet, even yet, hundreds of years after 1066. Now, the last bit, each is I. That, by the way, is exactly how the Germans write the word I, ich, I-C-H. And it's our I-C with a fronted C from Old English, each. Each wein, I think, I ween. And now he's going to get reflective on us and say this situation in England is it's unique in the world. Each wein, their ne beeth, I believe their not beeth, in all the world, countries non, we would say no countries, he says countries non, that ne holdeth, hey, there's that verb again, to her own speech, to their, that hold on to their own speech, but England on, and we would say alone for one. So he's just said, I don't think anywhere in the whole world there's a situation where a people did not hold on to their own speech, but England alone. In other words, the speech of England became French. I, I would just ask you to think about the entirety of what you've learned from McWhorter's Power of Babel in evaluating that. Is it true that a group of people keeps speaking its own language forever? And that there are no instances where a group of people starts speaking another language? Hmm. But that's his perspective. And it's a bit of sort of patriotism for him, a matter of shame that, yeah, he's got a chronicle, he's Robert, and he's noble, but it's a shame. And England's got to be unique in having been taken over, and we don't even get to keep our own language. He ends with this bit of advice to the reader, listener. Ack, but, old English, well may what, well I know. For, and that's for, with a U instead of a V, it's the same, same letter. To con both, well it is. It is good to know both. That is, it's good to know English and French. Why? For the more that a man can, that's the more that a man knows, can is know, kennen in German means to know. The more that a man knows, what? The more worth he is. The more he is worth. And again, I think we're thinking bank tellers. The more he can make. So think of all the money you could make if, say, you're a middleman or middle management or sort of a, an interpreter go between management on, say, an estate. So there's a French, Norman French uh, family living in the manor house or the castle, but they're peasants. They can't talk to each other directly, but what if you can talk to the peasants and the nobility? You've got quite a business opportunity. What if you can sell your goods to peasants and the court? You've got quite a, an earning potential. So he's saying bilingualism is in your economic best interest, right? So notice one thing too. He has taken the unusual decision to write this or have this chronicle written. He probably didn't write it himself. Not in Latin and not in French. He is, despite what he said, he's chosen to record this in England. And in fact, this is one of the first texts in England after the French are kicked out where the language returns to being English. But as we'll examine in upcoming language, this English that he's writing in right here, this Middle English, it's not the same English that existed in 1066. It's not the same Germanic language because it has been transformed into a whole new language, one more easily read by you, by the very events that he is describing.